Reach out to me. Lift your hands in the building. Father, we're honored by your presence. We're honored by the strength that you always provide when we gather together and worship. In times like these, we need your strength. I thank you for hearing our prayers, our praise, and our worship. I thank you for the manifestation of your strength as we continue in your word. Anoint every single moment. Anoint every single moment that we are together. Let no moment be wasted in honoring you, in hearing from you, in receiving from you. Be glorified by every single thought, intent, and word spoken is my prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Bless your hearts. God bless you. Greet someone before you. Don't touch them, but just, you know, do what you do. Greet somebody before you get your Bible, your electronic device. Thank you, band and worship team. Greet somebody. Just, just wave at them. Do something. Let them know. Just throw some anointing on them. Just do it like this. <laughs> amen. All right. Man, I'm glad to be in the house of God. Are you? And we're grateful for everyone that continues to watch. You're going to be blessed. Get your Bible or and your electronic device and turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse number three. We are continuing our teaching on the extravagant, everlasting love of God. You know, I, I had, we're going to continue. Uh, there, there, was a, there was a plan and, and a path that we were on. And God interrupted me. He said, I want you to tell them one more time how much I love them. Amen. Jeremiah 31 and 3, King James Version and the Bible reads, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Thee. Pray with me. Father, we thank you again. We thank you as your word is going forth. Anoint the teacher, the speaker, to say what thus saith the Lord, to say what is needed and necessary to build up your people. Anoint the ears of your people to hear clearly and receive. Anoint the hearts of your people so the word can bring forth fruit. All for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Uh, there's a subtopic subtitle of this particular teaching called God's love seized me God's love seized me grabbed me accosted me you know that's what God's love will do if we allow it to God's love will grab you shake you and get your attention and this is what we need in these last days. We need God's love to grab us, to seize us, to stop us in our tracks and say, hold up, hold tight. I got you. Why are you tripping? <laughs> Here's three other translations of this same verse in Jeremiah 31, 3. God's word to the nations reads, the Lord appeared to me in a faraway place and said, I love you with an everlasting love, so I will continue to show you my kindness. ESV reads, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. The NIV. The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Think about these words that are used to try to express the extravagant, everlasting love God has for you and I. The writer says, God appeared a long time ago. 
Notice the words. God appeared a long time ago. In other words, God showed up just to say, I love you. He showed up, he appeared just to say, I just called to say, I love you. He just showed up just to say. I want you to think about that for a minute. This is God who is omnipresent. He's already everywhere at once, but he manifested out of eternity into time to tell beings that live in time, I love you. This is God showing up. It's not your neighbor, your cousin, your boyfriend, your husband, your wife. This is God, the creator of everything, showing up, manifesting, just to say, I love you, I've always loved you, and I'll always be kind to you. See, see, we need to learn and to discover and understand God's love. I'm, I'm going to say it again. We need to learn God's love. We need to understand God's love. Dare I say that for too long, in my humble opinion, the church has tried to understand church, understand how to do church, so that people want to come to church. But we've not learned how much God loves us. So we struggle with being accepted even amongst each other. Dare I say, there are so many believers that don't know how much God loves them so they don't understand God's purpose for them or even that God has a purpose for them. God appeared just to say, I want you to know I love you. How many of you really, really, really think about how much God loves you? The King James Version of what we just read in Jeremiah 31, 3, and you'll find it throughout the Old Testament, uses the word loving kindness. <clears throat> Excuse me, loving kindness. God says, I love you so much. It's with loving kindness I've drawn you. It's the Hebrew word hased, it's the Hebrew word hased. Now, like most words um, in Hebrew and other languages, we don't have a equivalent in the English language. There, re there really is no equivalent to the word hased. In the Old Testament, there is no English word that's equivalent to let us know how much God, there's not one English word that is broad enough in scope, deep enough to explain how much God loves us. So there are several words that are used, but this word loving kindness is a word <laughs> that was invented by a man named Miles Coverdale, who wrote the Coverdale Bible. In fact, Miles Coverdale was the first man to translate the entire Bible into English. So while he was translating the word has said, he said, hmm, hmm, hmm. What word can I use to help people understand God's love? So he said loving kindness. And it's been translated that way in most English Bibles for centuries. And, and I'm not here to, to, to get all over Miles Coverdale. I appreciate what he's done. But I, I need, and it's important that we understand that there's more than one word. We're talking about, listen now, we're talking about God. We're talking about God's love for us. There's no way in my lifetime, if I preached, if I lived another 60 years and all I did was preach on the love of God, I still couldn't explain to you how much God loves you. Because we're talking about God. 
So, so with that in mind, let, let's, let's, let's go deeper. Let's, let's set our cups out like the old saints used to say. Set your cup out. Get your mind ready. Let your heart be open to the word of God as, as, as a little bitty earthen vessel like myself tries to explain to you how much a great, big, infinite, awesome God loves you. Let me fail miserably at trying to explain and express to you how much God loves you. So, Miles Coverdale says, I have to try to find a way to express to God's people how much he loves them. So, the best way to understand God's love is to compare it with the love we get from those who love us deeply. You see what I'm saying? The best thing we can do is call anthropomorphism, where there are physical attributes ascribed to God who is spirit. But the best way we can understand him is saying his hand reached down and pick me up out of the horrible pit. Well, God doesn't have a physical hand, but it expresses something we can understand. And so the best way to understand God's love for you and I, for his children, is to compare his love with those that love us deeply, that we already express, we feel, and we are aware of. This is, again, I'm saying a whole lot. This is why. Let me read the scripture first, then I'll say what I need to say. All right, Psalm 103, and actually we're going to stay in the book of Psalm. Just going to use three examples because I want you to remember them. Psalm 103, <coughs> verse 13. It reads, King James, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Pity. That's the word compassion. <laughs> For us to understand the compassion of our heavenly father, we need to understand the compassion of our earthly fathers. Now I'm going to say what I was going to say before. This is why the enemy has worked overtime to destroy the family. Because if your father abandons you, you can't understand this scripture. If you never had a father to love you and pity you, you can't understand this scripture. So it makes it hard for you to understand how much God loves you. If you had an abusive father, this scripture might make you angry instead of making you understand how much God loves you because you weren't loved like this. You weren't shown compassion by your father. So the enemy is working overtime to destroy that relationship fathers have with their children. But those of us that overcame not having a father, hallelujah. Those of us that got filled with the Holy Ghost and let him make up the difference in our lives. I, I feel like preaching, but I'm not going to. See, you, you shouldn't be sad once you get saved. This is why this is so powerful to understand the love of God because God's love will fill up every gap, every space, everywhere it's lacking in your life. God will make up the difference. See, you, 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 you won't have to be mad at your daddy because your heavenly father will be better to you than 10 fathers. If you let him, if you let him. So, the psalm writer says it's like a father pities his children. So the Lord, your God, your father in heaven, pities them that fear, reverence, and respect him. You know, as I was going through the scripture, obviously I first looked at my life growing up, my mother raising three boys by herself, and not having a father, my father present. And then as I grew up and mature and became a man, and then me and Pastor Deborah had children, I became a father. I had to constantly ask God to show me, to help me be what I didn't have an example of. But I understand what it means to be a father to pity your children. 
You know, your children, our children go through steps and stages in life where they don't always make the best decisions. Sometimes our children do dumb stuff. Sometimes they hurt themselves and they hurt us as well as hurting other people. And we have to take time to teach them, allow them to heal and then tell them. But life goes on. Pick yourself up. Dust yourself off. Life is not over. You made a mistake, but you can overcome this mistake. That's father's pitying their children, having compassion. Boy, you're not what you did, girl. You're not what happened to you. Let's clean yourself up. Get back in line with the word and finish your assignment. That's what fathers do. Let me help two more fathers. Some fathers just need to get over it. That's your son. That's your daughter. Just get over it. They disappointed you. Have some pity. Have some compassion. You didn't always get it right when you were 16, 17, 19, 20, even 30. Come on, somebody. You need to have some compassion on your children so they can understand how much compassion God has on them. Somebody's going to get it right. Somebody's going to get it right today. Someone's going to change their mind called repent today. Someone's going to get back in tr on track today. Why? Because of the love of God. You know, I grew up, people used to say, man, you know, we serve a second chance God. And then folk got the revelation that we serve another chance God. Some of y'all, this may be your 50th chance, but you're going to get it right this time. It, it, this, this, this may be somebody's 70th time, but you're going to get it right this time. Because God has compassion on you. He knows the struggles and the challenges that you're facing. Some of you, oh, I'm going to go there right now. Some of you don't even know the challenge that you keep having over and over again is based on DNA and not something you did. It's in you. If your daddy was around and your granddaddy, they would tell you they had the same struggle. But because they're not around, you think it's your struggle alone. But it's not your struggle alone. It's in you. It's a generational struggle. And God understands that and he has pity on you. And that's why you're coming out today. You're going to get the revelation today. God still loves you after the 69th time you did that. Father's pity their children. I remember when Cameron made the freshman basketball team and then they cut him the sophomore year. He was, he was, he was devastated. And I, I had pity on him. I, I, I didn't jump on him and say, boy, you should have learned how to dribble better. And boy, you didn't teach what I taught you. and You didn't do what I did. And now I'm doing that, man. Look, you're going to be all right. I know you really wanted to make the team, but you didn't. You're going to be a preacher anyway. I told him back then, you're going to be no ball player. You 5'8". Come on, dude. Why am I saying that? Because see, you got to stop telling your children irrational things. Stop trying to live through your children. Oh, you're going to be a nuclear scientist. Boy, can't even do math. I'm going to teach on that. It's called flattery. Flattery is unjust praise. Boy, we live in an hour. I don't want to get, I don't want to get twisted on this, but I, I really, we live in an hour where there's so much flattery online. People like you that don't even know you. That's unjust praise. Then people don't know you. You think all these people like you? That's flattery. All those thumbs up. Let me, let me stop. See, this is why, ooh, I can't wait to teach you. You can tell, can't you? All these people don't know you telling you to go on and be an astronaut. You're 60. It's too late to be an astronaut. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Flattery. Fathers, mothers, don't flatter your children. Listen, uh oh. <laughs> See, I grew up in a, in a generation around, you know, brothers that would tell you to take that off. You don't look good in there. Take that off. See, it's getting quiet now. It's getting real quiet. See, you meddling. See, I don't like it when Bishop go to meddling. Get back in that word. I'm in the word. Some of y'all walked out the house. Somebody should have told you to take that off. Okay, I'm going to go on. I'm going to go on. I'm going to go on. I am. 
I'm going to say this. I'm going to move on. I'm just saying this because I love y'all. And I, and I just like being around y'all. Y'all make me happy. You make me smile. You make you get stuff to come out of me. Have you ever, you ever been somewhere where you travel? Let's just say you travel. And uh, you were out somewhere in public. And you ran into somebody you didn't know. And what they had on made you, my, your mouth drop. And then you had to catch yourself. Oh, <laughs> you don't want to offend about it. I, and, and then, and then uh, you know, it happened to me one time. Well, more than once. I was with Pastor Evan, and I saw this, this, this young lady. And she just should not have had on what she had on. Outdoors. And when I saw her, my mouth dropped, then she tried to wrap herself up. I'm like, see, that's proof you should have never came out with that on. Why are you gonna wrap yourself up now? Didn't you know you was going outdoors? Other people was gonna see you. But maybe somebody flattered her. Ooh. So you, you need a daddy like me. <laughs> Let's go back. Let's go back. All right, I'm going back. I'm going back. All right. As a father pitieth his children, he going to tell you you don't look good in that. Take that off. I have, I'm, take that off. Stop acting that way. Um, you need to know that there's pain in pity. There's pain in pity. Pity suggests someone being hurt by your experience. And then they in turn have to respond to you based on their pity of you. Most people that I know, a lot of people that I know, don't like pity. Because pity seems to belittle people it it can doesn't have to it can rob people of their dignity so 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 we need to understand that when we make a mistake when we sin when we fall when we fail God pities us without taking any dignity from us he still sees you as his son. He still sees you as his daughter. He just knows you didn't live up to your expectation, that you had more knowledge, more revelation, more understanding. You should not have made the mistake you made. I'm going to have pity on you, but at the same time, I want you to come up. Live up to your potential. Look at someone and say it politely to them. Live up to your potential and you won't be pitied. Psalm 103, verse 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Notice another comparison that has to be made. As far as the heavens are from the earth, oh my God, who can measure that? How far is the heavens from the earth? It is absolutely immeasurable. That's how great God's love is for you and I. You cannot measure God's love for you. Tell your neighbor. If you're watching, tell someone. If you're not, if you're by yourself, say it to yourself. I can't measure how much God loves me. That means you have no idea we have no concept. We cannot even imagine how much God loves us. Is something beginning to happen in your brain, in your mind, as you begin to understand how much God really loves you? Something should be getting to change in your mind, in your heart, as you meditate, as you think about the love God has for you. It's immeasurable. There's nobody on the planet that love you like God. It's not possible for anyone else to love us like God loves us. That begs the question then, so why are you doing all this stuff for other people and ain't doing nothing for God? Why are you making all these sacrifices for human beings and not making sacrifices for God? Because nobody can love you like God. God's love is immeasurable. 
you can't fathom how much God loves you. But the issue is, we're supposed to try. Oh, now let me help you. You and I are supposed to try to imagine and measure God's love. That's the only way we're going to understand it. You just can't say, yeah, oh yeah, well, that's it. No, no, no. Try to measure it. How? By all the things you did that didn't stop God from loving you. By all the places you've been and God loved you anyway. By how you've been thinking since you've been saved and God loves you. Anyway, Psalm 103, 17, but the hased, the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting, oh man, to everlasting for those who fear him. Notice there's a condition there. It's for those who fear him. This isn't everybody because there's some people that don't fear God. There's some that aren't his children. So his love isn't quite the same for them. See, there's another reason you need to understand God loves you. You're the apple of his eye. That's why you're saved. God didn't save you because you quoted the words. <laughs> God saved you because he loved you. He drew you to him to say the words because he loved you. Mm-hmm. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to who? His children's children. Write this down. Everlasting to everlasting speaks of eternity. From everlasting to everlasting speaks of eternity. Write this down. Eternity is that which has no beginning and no ending. Eternity, anything that is eternal, God is eternal. They have, well, he's the only one that's eternal, has no beginning and no ending. He always was, will be, has been. He's just eternal. He has no beginning and no ending. But something that is everlasting has a beginning but no ending. Once it's created or built, it lasts forever. So when the scripture says from everlasting to everlasting, they're talking about eternity. God's loving kindness, his tender mercies, his compassion, his kindness towards his children are eternal. They last forever. Think about it this way. By show of hands, how many of you would raise your hand and say, God's been good to you? Okay, put your hand down. By show of hands, how many of you would say, God's been real good to you? Okay, put your hands down. By show of hands, how many of you say, God has been real, real, real good to me? Okay, yeah, and, and that, that begins to, you know, give us a, a response of praise. But watch this. Here's the awesome thing about it is, it, it, since God loves us with an extravagant, everlasting love, you haven't even begun to see how good he's going to be to you. You, 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 have no, you have no idea. I have not seen, neither ear heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of how good God wants to be to you. You haven't seen anything yet. See, these, these thoughts, this understanding of God's love, as it builds in us, it builds what? Expectation. Because if it's God has been this good and we haven't lived but a few years on this planet, how much better is he going to be in eternity? So then it puts and builds an expectation in us. It puts a hope in us. And what is it else it does it do? It makes us want to say, hmm, like Moses. 
if I found favor in your sight already and you've been this good, what do I need to do to find more favor? See, it changes your outlook on life. It changes your next move. Oh, God. Man, I felt something when I said, God, when you understand how much he loves you, it's changing your next move. Somebody's not going to do what they were getting ready to do because the love of God is about to be shed in your heart and you're going to realize I can't do that and hurt God because he loves me too much. Your next move changes when you understand how much he loves you. Your, oh, I feel that. Your next move. Somebody shout, make another move. Make another move. Mm, make another move. Bust another move. From everlasting to everlasting. In other words, write this down. God's love for you and I, of course, has no boundaries. <laughs> God's love for you and I has no boundaries. No limitations. There's nowhere God won't go to get you. There's nowhere you can go you won't find God's love for you. Let me talk to somebody that felt like you failed, you blew it the last time, you've been hard head for 20, 30 years, and you just feel like God can't possibly love me out of this. Yes, he can. That's why we need these type of messages so we realize that God's love has no boundaries, has no limitations, and it cannot be contained. Your love, your sin does not stop God from loving you. And when you understand that, it will keep you from sinning. He loves you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Because he made a decision to love you. It's not emotional. It's not an emotional thing with God. It's a decision with God. I'm loved just because God made me. He loves me because he made me in his image and in his likeness. And then he saved me. Then he filled me with his Holy Ghost. Then he gave me peace in my heart. I know God loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Aren't you glad, God? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad, God? Yes. Jesus loves me. Yes. Ooh. Jesus loves me. Even in these last days, yes. Famine, pestilence, plagues. Jesus loves me. For the Bible, yes, he loves you just because he said he does. Somebody say yes to his love right now. Say yes to his love. Just say, let him love on you. Let him, oh, yes, God. Let him love on you. Let him heal you right now. He's not holding back anything from you. Let him heal your body. Let him heal your soul. Somebody's been, their, their soul, their mind has been overwhelmed by problems and challenges during the pandemic. But let God love you out of that. Love you beyond that. You see, in those three scriptures, in just those three scriptures, I declared to you through the scriptures, by God's word, nothing is closer, higher, or lasts longer than our relationship with God when we live in truth and obey him. Write that down. Write it down. It's important. Nothing and nobody can get closer to us than God. His love for us is higher than anybody else's love. His love lasts longer than anybody else's love. When we understand the relationship we have with God, live in truth 
and obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do what I say. The way we balance out the covenant relationship, and let me just say this plainly. Hesed speaks of a covenant relationship. It's a two-way thing. This is where a lot of folk get in trouble. Because you think God's love is just one way. You, he just loves you no matter what you do. So you keep doing dumb stuff and sinning, and you think God's just going to love you. know, that's, that's not love. See, the only way we can ensure to God or make sure to God or demonstrate to God that we understand his love for us is by obeying him. Write that down. That's going to get you tonight. The only way we demonstrate to God that we understand his love for us is through obeying him. Now, as elementary as that may sound, it is yet still a profound statement. Because anyone that has raised children knows exactly what I'm talking about. You Listen, I didn't bought a house for you to live in. I bought you all your clothes. I paid for your food. I paid for every little, little, little you wanted to play the, the violin. We bought you a violin, then you dropped it and broke it. Then you wanted to play something else. We bought that. Then you wanted to play football. We sent you to that. We did all this stuff we done done for you. We don't, we love doing it. The only thing we want you to do is obey. And after parent does all of that and you keep disobeying, they're going to wonder, do you understand how much they love you? Because if you did, you wouldn't do all this crazy stuff. You can't, you, you, you can't, listen, you're 18, you can't afford to live on your own. You can't pay no mortgage. You can't even put gas in a car. You can't even pay for the insurance on a car. And you're going to be disobedient. You, you don't know how much we love you. You don't get it. You ain't got to clap because I know you're scared of your kids. I ain't scared of mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Love, the understanding of the love we receive is indicative in our obedience, even in the church. You don't know how much you're loved by this ministry if you don't serve, don't give. And, and the claps begin to... Listen, it's very simple. You obey who you love. You partner with those you love. You don't constantly fight against the church if you love the church. You don't constantly fight against the pastor if you know the man of God loves you and is giving you God's word. You don't fight against your spouse if you know they're in it to help you succeed with them. Why would you disobey? Why would you be so gnarly? <laughs> That's like Nabal. Y'all missed it. Listen to Wednesday message. So Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what I say. That equals out the covenant. Even though Jesus does way more for us than we could do for him, he just wants us to obey. I don't want you to die on the cross. I did it. I don't want you to get slapped upside the head. I was. I don't want you to be put in a hole in the ground. I don't. I was. I just want you to obey. That lets me know you understand my love for you. And the covenant is cool. It's sealed. The children who fear him, the children who fear God, are the ones that learn every day about his love for them. That's why we have to study the Bible every day, renew our minds, because the world is constantly trying to tell you God don't love you. See, if God loves you, why are you in the condition you're in? See, you don't understand God's love. You haven't read the book. You're listening to what other people are telling you about God's love instead of what God is telling you about his love. Remember, you know, I don't know if y'all do this stuff today. It's times change so drastically. But I remember back in the day when I was a little boy, you had a little crush on a, on a girl, you would tell your friend to tell her. <laughs> Go tell Debbie I like her. If she like me, tell her to put her ponytail on the left side.
We, we, we laugh at that, but people are still doing that kind of stuff today with God. God didn't, God's mad at me, I didn't get that job. That ain't God. Once we study the word, we learn how much he loves us. We learn from what David did, and he should have been stoned. That was God's law, but God didn't stone David. That's why the Bible calls it the sure mercies of David. David, I've said this to you before, David is a, a, new, a type of New Testament believer. By, by the law, anyone that, that, that commits adultery and murders a man should have been stoned. David should have been stoned, but God didn't, listen, God didn't let David get stoned. God had mercy on David like he does New Testament believers. You and I, when we sin, we don't get stoned. But watch this. The mercy of God is on us. Some of us right now listening, some of you watching right now, you know some things you don't even want to tell anybody you've done since you've been saved. But look at the mercy of God that's on your life. You're still breathing right now today, earning a good living, living after what you did that nobody knows but you and God. And I'm, this is where we're going to go because we started turning the corner, but God wanted me to come back and say this. But in all of that, what David did, you need to understand the Bible says about David, the sword never departed from his house. In other words, there were consequences that David suffered and they suffered him generationally because of his sin. And the world is in the condition it's in right now because of consequences. We talked about that too. Things that our forefathers did, we're suffering for it now. This is why we need to understand the Bible and God's love so that we don't do things that cause the next generation to keep suffering. Why do you think all these young people are so angry? Because they're suffering from sins of the forefathers. The consequences. The children of God that fear him as I said, they learn of his love for them every day. And as they hear, hear me, as we continue to learn of God's extravagant, everlasting love, it seizes us. His love overtakes us. You can't meditate on God's love and not stop in your tracks. Some of us need to be stopped in our tracks. That's what happened to Paul on the Damascus Road. Paul, Saul rather, thought he was doing the right thing, persecuting Christians until the love of God in Jesus meets him and seizes Paul and says, Paul, what you doing? I'm paraphrasing. What you doing? Where you going? He thought he was doing the will of God until the love of God showed up in his life and seized him. I pray today, even right now, that the love of God begins to seize somebody's mind seize their heart stop them from some of the things they were about to do that does not please god stop you from doing something that was going to hurt somebody else let the love of god seize capture your heart captivate your mind when we begin to understand how much god loves us it changes hear me how we see everything write it down the more we learn about God's love, it changes how we see the world. The grass is greener, the sky is bluer, the clouds are fluffier. Your husband ain't so bad, your wife ain't really so bad. Your children ain't that bad. It changes how you see everything because you see everything with the love of God and you see the love of God on everything. The only reason we're all alive today is because his love is still on us. The only reason we're still alive is because his love is still on us. He still has some work for us to do. Hmm. The last days, in the last days, People won't see the love of God 
because their focus will be on the plagues, earthquakes, fires, unemployment, famine, wars. They don't see the love of God. And that's, that's, that's a tragedy, particularly for believers. Let me tell you something. Can I say something to you? You might as well say, yeah, I'm going to say it anyway. Say, just say, yeah, shake your head. Amen. Listen, listen. This is a word of wisdom for everybody. You need to cut down the amount of time you spend watching world news. It's going to keep you from seeing the love of God. All you're going to see is pain, destruction, misery, contradiction, confusion. This is why everybody's angry. Well, most people are angry and frustrated and they, listen, they're duct taping people to airplane seats. How crazy is that? Why would you fight on a plane? We can all go down. Come on, chill, relax. This last 16 to 18 months where we've cut our faces not been able to see the expression on so many people's faces has emotionally scarred us. Listen, 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 listen. Do you know why God gave us teeth? Not just to eat, but to smile. A smile changes the atmosphere. But if you always got a mask, and I'm not anti-mask I'm not teaching that I'm talking about why people feel the way they do and don't feel love because they're not seeing smiles and they're not seeing expressions of kindness they just see a mask this is the devil y'all and let me just say this this whole va uh, a mask vaccine no vaccine it's to create division listen I stop tell uh, listen listen I'm just li 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 I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let you in I'm let you in now. I'm going to let you in. I'm going to let you in. God told me at the very beginning, y'all heard me teach Romans 14. Man eats meat, God accepts him. Man doesn't eat meat, God accepts him. Listen, whether you vaccine or don't vaccine, God accepts you. And in, 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 that, in that same chapter, Paul says, don't destroy another brother by your meat. I eat meat. I don't know what's wrong with him. You ain't got a revelation. Man, I eat me some good meat. Or, man, I don't know, you stupid. You ain't, got, you ain't got your shot. Man, you just dumb. Or, conversely, you, you believe in them? You taking that shot? Ooh, you crazy. See, you're destroying your brother by your decision. It's causing division in the church. God goes on to say, watch this, through Paul. He says, what you do, some things you need to have faith to yourself and God alone. It ain't nobody else's business. Because whatsoever, not a faith is sin. So let me tell you something. If you put your faith in the vaccine and you're going to have seven of them and you're still scared to come to church, it ain't faith. And if you haven't had the vaccine and you ain't coming to church and you're still scared, it still ain't faith. Whatsoever you do, it needs to have faith in God. It's got to be God. I ain't taking the vaccine. I got, I'm taking zinc and, and, and uh, you make up all these. <laughs> oh God, let me stop. Listen, whatever you do, have faith in God. And you might need to keep it to yourself so your cousin don't fall out with you. I don't tell preachers what I'm doing. Listen, listen I'm to preach the gospel, not vaccines and pestilences. And Come on, y'all, really? This is why we need to know how much God loves us. God knew Corona, Delta, every variant was coming and his love is still here. His love is still here. Nothing can separate you and I from the love of God. Not a mask, not a, come on somebody. This is why we need to remember, he loves me. 
unconditionally. Whether I'm in a hospital or sitting at home, he still loves me. And if I'm in the hospital, let his love soothe your heart and give you peace and possibly bring you home. God loves me regardless. That's all that matters. God loves me. God loves you more than you and I could ever imagine. Put that on your list of things to be concerned about in these last days. Because Jesus said in Matthew 24, there are going to be plagues and pestilences, famine. Does that mean God stopped loving us? No. But if you listen to the world, they'll tell you, it's getting worse and worse out there. We don't know what we're going to do. We're getting scientists together. I mean, there are people that literally think God's love for America changed when we got a new president. Say la. You get that on the way home. Listen, this is going to surprise some of you. I, I'm not afraid to say this. God is not a Democrat or a Republican. Some of y'all need to write that down. You thought he was. <laughs> can, I, can I tell you something else? This is going to really shock you. God is not a Christian. See, we, we, too many people have put God in this little box. He's either in a cultural box where he only loves your people and he doesn't too much care about the other type of people that aren't that. Mm -hmm. Or that God loves America more than he loves another country. He loves his people and God has people in probably every continent on the globe. He loves them like he loves you. So how should we think about them? How should we pray about them? What should we do to help them? The Bible says, let me get out of here. That in the last days, the love of many will grow cold for God and for others. We're living in those days now. Jesus even says in one place that in the last days, people that kill you will be thinking they're doing God a favor. That sounds like, that sounds like, that sounds like there's coming a time very shortly when there'll be a state-run church. And if you're not a part of the state-run church where the state makes the rules they're going to think it's okay to get rid of you that want to follow God's rules let me say it another way the state run church will probably make it illegal to preach against homosexuality and lesbianism I wish I could go deeper maybe later let me put this on your mind as we finish this Look at all the liberties that are being taken away from us. Oh, let me be controversial. They should, in my humble opinion, have never taken away President Trump's ability to use social media. One of the biggest and best blessings about this country is the freedom of speech. So I can say that because I'm a preacher. Nobody should tell me I can't preach about anything. And so they shouldn't tell Donald Trump or anybody else, even if it's hate speech. The, the point is, you ought to be able to say it. Because once you begin to govern what people say, now you've changed the government and the state and the culture. And so, oh God. 
I, I can't even go any further. That's a whole nother message. See, there are people literally messages being taken off YouTube when you don't say what the world wants you to say. It. So you got to have somewhere to say what God wants you to say, even if the world doesn't want you to hear it. But if the world controls all the media, the media, then where are you going to have a place to say what God wants you to say without it being censored? And some of you are old enough in here to know history. This isn't China, Russia, Korea. We ought to be able to say whatever we want to say so that people can get the truth. But when the government begins to say what you can and can't say, we got some major problems going on. And you need to understand that. Hased, as I said, is covenant love. It's love, it's the attitude that's, that, that both parties have towards one another that maintains the relationship in health. Hmm. Let me say that again. Covenant love is love that both parties have for one another that both parties know what is required of the other to maintain the healthy covenant. The Bible says a three-braided cord is not easily broken. That, that, that one, of those, one of the main things it speaks to is marriage. When a man and a woman unite with God, that's three, in covenant. It's hard to break a marriage that God is in. It's really hard to break up a marriage. I'm not saying it won't be hard. You won't have some hard times. You may have to separate and come back. All that, But I'm telling you, it's hard to break up a marriage if God is really in it. Because God is going to always do his part. You can count on God loving you in the midst of your struggle. You can count on God loving her if she cheat on you. You can count on God loving him if he cheat on you. You can count on the love of God so you can keep giving each other love. But when God's not in it and there's no covenant love for God, that's why folks just, I ain't got no more love. How you just going to have no more love like that when God all up in you? Oh, so you were loving him or her with your love. And our love has limits. I just taught you that God's love is measureless, immeasurable, has no limit. But our love does. Mm. Covenant love. Covenant love expresses unfailing loyalty. That's what God does. God's love is loyal. You can't destroy it at this present time. He just straight up loves you, period. It's a love, God's love is a love that will always be ready to manifest in your life. Always ready. God's love is ready to manifest in your life right now. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter how hard it is, God's love will be there. All you need to do is ask for it. Come boldly to the throne of grace. You see, I know these are the last days. Been teaching on it, been studying it for a long time. But you see, I'm not going to Turn on God because the times are hard. I'm not going to stop reading the Bible because times are hard. I'm not going to stop preaching the truth because ain't much changing. I'm not going to turn my back on God because I understand his love for me. How could I turn my back on the love he has for me? I'm asking you that question. How, how, how can you turn your back on such extravagant love? As much as he's pitied you, how can you turn your back on a God that's pitied you like 
this? How can you turn your back on a God that loves you with an everlasting love? How can you turn your back on a God that loves you from as far as the heavens are from the earth? Immeasurable love. How can you turn your back on a God whose love has no boundaries and no limitations? How can you turn your back on the church where he has come to manifest his love and who happens to be his bride? How can you turn away from God just because things didn't turn out the way you expected? How can you stop trusting God and start trusting man in this hour when man can never love you the way God loves you? Again, Jesus says in John 14, 15, if we love him, we will do what he says. Proof, my brother, proof my sister, that you understand God's love (laughs) is that you are increasingly more obedient the longer you serve him. You can't serve him and get less obedient. How you gonna get less obedient? How you gonna pray less? How you gonna give less? How are you going to serve less and cause God to believe you love him? You can fake folk out, but you can't fake out God. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus says, Go therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Verse 20 says, teaching them to observe all the things I have said, all the things I have commanded you. Then he says, lo, I am with you always, even till the end of the world. We might be the last generation, but my brother and my sister, you need to know God is still in the midst. His love is still right here. God didn't say, when it get rough, I'm out of here. No, when it get rough, I am still here. My love is still, I know it's tough. I know it is. I get it. I'm in the same world you in. I'm experiencing some, of the, experiencing some of the same things you are. But I keep, I try my best to keep my eyes and my mind on Jesus. Because he promised he would always be with me. Jesus literally says, I'm with you every day even until the end. It can't get too rough for God to leave your life. Come on, lift your hands right there. It can't get my Sabbath. It can't get too rough for God to leave your life. I know you didn't have some homies. We used to call them road dogs. Ride or die. I want you to know some folk quit riding when it got too hard. But God is your ride. He already died. He will never leave you nor forsake you. I want somebody in here that wants to experience more of God's love just to stand up right where you are as a signal to God. Pour more of your love in me. Give me understanding of this awesome, extravagant, everlasting love that you have for me. 1 John 4, 19 says, We love him because he first loved us. You and I must first embrace and understand God's love for us before we could ever hope to love him right. 
if you don't understand how much he loves you, then your love is small and your service is small. Your commitment is small. Your righteousness is small. Your holiness is small. Your prayer life is small. Your worship life is small. Everything about you is small until you understand how big his love is. It's time for you to live bigger. Hey, hallelujah. It's time for the church to live bigger. Remain standing. Deuteronomy 23, 5. Nevertheless, the Lord your God was not willing to listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for your God, for because the Lord your God loves you. God is still turning curses into blessings because he loves you. I want somebody to receive this right now. God is still turning curses into blessings simply, hey, hallelujah, simply because he loves you. God is turning it around in your life right now all because he loves you. I don't care who cursed you. I don't care how many generations that curse has existed. If you receive his love, he's turning it into a blessing because the Lord your God loves you. If you've believed you were cursed, believe this, God's turning it around right now. God's turning it around right now. He's turning it around because he loves you. As you begin to understand and grow in the knowledge of God's love for you, Psalm 63.3 becomes more real to you, becomes more a part of your life. This is what it says. Because thy loving kindness has said, <laughs> because your tender mercies, because your extravagant love is better than life, my lips will praise you. When you really realize how much God loves you, you go throughout your day, you see God and everything. God, I thank you. I made it safely. I praise you. God, I thank you that this didn't happen. I praise you. God, I thank you for lunch. I give you praise. I thank you for this nice cold drink. I give you praise. I thank you. I can put gas in my car to go. To. I thank you, God. You've been good. I can go into my own house. My own. I thank you because your loving kindness is better than life I have to open my mouth and give you praise I see your love everywhere all around me in my lamp in the lights when I turn in the water I see I see your love everywhere hallelujah hallelujah I see your love in my granddaughter's eyes. I see your love in my spouse's embrace. I see your love all around me. Stop looking at all this crazy that Jesus said will come. It's going to get worse, but you know what he said? In Matthew 24, I believe verse 6, he said, see that you be not moved by this. Don't be moved by the bad. Be moved by the good. Don't be moved by the hate. Be moved by the love. Don't be moved by the devil. Be moved by God. These things are going to happen, but they should not move you. The only thing that should move you and I is the love of God. My last scripture. Maybe. Remain standing. I'm almost done for real. Psalm 146, 8. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are bowed down or bowed down. Why? Because the Lord loves the righteous. Somebody's been bowed down with trouble, pain, agony, 
sickness, disease, troubles in your life, troubles on your job, troubles in your finances. You just feel bent down, bold, weakened. But God wants me to let you know he loves you. He's about to straighten things up in your life. He's about to straighten it up. He's about to take that load. Come on, cast your cares upon him. He cares for you. Stop carrying those problems. Stop carrying those issues and let the Lord fight your battle. And then this is really my last scripture. Isaiah 63, 7. I will make mention of the loving kindness of the Lord. You need to open your mouth and talk about how good he is. Stop talking about, man, is it going to be another variant? Is it going to be another? Got to put on three masks? Is it going to be another shutdown? Stop talking that and talk about the loving kindness that, oh God, that he has shared you. That he has shown you. That he has been to you. He says, I will open my mouth and mention how good God is. All these naysayers, all these negative people, open up your mouth and talk about how good God has been to you. And he says, and the praises of the Lord. He says, according to all that the Lord has granted us. You need somebody. Yes. Somebody needs to go home and begin to make a list of all the good things God has done to you since you've been saved. All the good since you've been saved. Since you've been saved. All that God has granted us and the great goodness towards the house of Israel. Has he been good to the church as a whole, the church universal? Has he been good to this local church that you've been a part of? You see, you need to understand how good God is is which he has granted them according to his compassion and according to the multitude of his loving kindness everybody bow your heads father i hope and pray that i didn't fail too bad at this assignment of trying to explain to your people how extravagant, excessive your love is. How limitless your love is. How boundless, it cannot be bound, your love is. The great love that you have for your children that obey you. We thank you today. We're going to make mention of your goodness. We're going to remind ourselves and those that we know how much you love us because you've been good. Because you are good. Your mercy is everlasting. And your truth endures forever. Now, Father, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice, either in the sanctuary or watching right now, they want to be saved. They need to be saved. They just heard, maybe for the first time, how much you love them. They've been told they're a failure over and over again. They've been told that by people that love them. They didn't have a father that pitied them. They didn't have a mother to nurture them. They've been told time and time again most of their life that they're not worth anything. But today, your word has reached them. Your love has reached them. And today, they realize you are, they are the apple of your eye. And you love them with the everlasting love that you made a decision to love them before they were even born. Lift your hands today and say this prayer with me if you want to be saved. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your love that you display on Golgotha. You demonstrated your love for me when you died in front of the whole universe for my sin. And so today, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. I accept your sacrifice for my sins. And today, I want you to save me and fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live the rest of my life displaying the love you have for me to everyone else I come in contact with. Bless me to serve you for the rest of my life with the power of God fueling every deed and every activity I do. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. Why don't you put your hands together and just thank the Lord. Just thank him. Thank you for loving us. Just lift your hands. Just keep it lifted for a moment. The Lord is in this place. His love is moving in our midst. Nobody's left out. Nobody's rejected. He loves you. He loves you. My, 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 my. Let it manifest in you and upon you. Let it change how you think, how you see yourself, how you see everyone else because his love is ever 